Let's pronounce, please. Humble obeisances, all glories to. Um, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Um, thank you, Guru Maharaj, for joining today's call to enlighten us on the topic of your devotional service. Hare Krishna, dear devotees, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. So, Guru Maharaj will continue to enlighten us on the topic. Uh, Pure devotional service from Madhilila, chapter 22, verse 88 to 90. Yeah. Guru Maharaj, should I share, Guru Maharaj? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just a few minutes. I'll turn it over to you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Um, go to the Sanskrit. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Satyam Saucham Dayam Manam Uririsriyasa Shama Samudhamo Bhagas Chaiti Yat Sangadhyati Sangsayam Tesvasan Teshu Mudeshu Kanditat Maswasadushu Sangam na kuryach cho chesu yos kridam brigeshu cha na tatasya pavin moho mandas chanya prasangataha yos it sangam yata kumso yata tat sangi sangataha. Translation, by association one with, with worldly people, one becomes devoid of truthfulness, friendliness, mercy, gravity, spiritual intelligence, shyness, austerity, fame, forgiveness, control of the mind, control of the senses, fortune in all opportunities. One should not at all time, not one should not at any time associate with a coarse fool who is bereft of the knowledge of self-realization, who is no more than a toy animal in the hands of a woman. The illusion and bondage that occur to a man from attachment to other any other object are not as complete as that resulting from association with a woman or was men too much attached to women? Report. This first quoted from Srimad Bhagavatam 331, 33 to 35, was spoken by Kapila Dev, the incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, to his mother. Herein, Kapila Dev discusses pious and impious activities and the symptoms of those who are devoid of devotional service to Krishna. Generally, people do not know about the miserable conditions within the womb of a mother in any species of life. Due to bad association, one gradually falls into lower species. Association with women is greatly stressed in this regard. When one becomes attached to women or to those who are attached to women, one falls down in the lower species. Purusho prakriti stohi bhunti prakriti jan gunan karanam guna sangosya sarasad yoni jan vasu. The living entity in material nature thus follows the ways of life. 
enjoying the three modes of nature. This is due to his association with that material nature. Thus he meets with good and evil amongst various species. According to Vedic civilization, one's association with women should very much be restricted. In spiritual life, there are four ashramas, brahmacharya, grihastha, vanaprastha, and sannyasa. The brahmachari, and vanaprastha, and sannyasi are completely forbidden to associate with women. Only grihasthas are allowed to associate with women under certain very much restricted conditions. That is, one associates with women to propagate nice children. Other reasons for association are condemned. Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamani Namaste Sarasvati Devi Gauravani Pacharine Nirvise Sasin Yavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Vanchakopa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Bhavacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namaha Namaha Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sri Vasudhi Gaur, Bhakti Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So here we see the uh, effects of association. Um, Association is really the nature of the living entity's characteristics. There's an old saying, tell me who you associate with and I'll tell you who you are. So association has a lot of influence in developing values, character, activities. And therefore, for one who is serious on the path of spiritual life, one has to restrict association accordingly. And that accordingly is in relationship to what is favorable for the execution of Krishna consciousness. Here, two kinds of association are being condemned. One is the association with the opposite sex and those who are attached, those persons who are attached to association with the opposite sex. Both of these associations lead one away from uh, the path of the Dharma. One should not misunderstand this particular verse as being a condemnation of women. It is not, it's simply talking about that association that is done to facilitate uh, sense gratification. There are sense gratification and there's sense satisfaction. Sense gratification is the terminology that is used to explain activities in the material world and sense satisfaction. This is a term that's used that how the senses become satisfied by engaging in devotional service. So um, a sense gratification is rejected. And here the two outstanding forms of sense gratification, which leads to certain characteristics and qualities are being condemned. Here it says association with worldly people. One becomes devoid of all of these good qualities. And then there's a list of good qualities that are mentioned here. And then also those who are very fond of associating with the opposite sex. That also is condemned. And then the opposite sex is also condemned. So there's a restriction in the association with the opposite sex, as it says. 
Kum sam striya mutuni bhavame tam tayor ivatama. Atho griha shatas, the whole atho griha shatras sutapta vitaya janasam aham yam aham mameti. The basic principle of spiritual life is the association with the opposite sex for the sake of sense gratification. Based on this misconception, as Rishabdev explains in the fifth canto, then so many unwanted activities start to develop. These unwanted activities bring one more and more. So um, therefore, the Vedas and Vedic knowledge, Vedic rules and regulations give restrictions for uh, association with the opposite sex. And here, as Prabhupada writes in the purport, and it, it's completely forbidden for those in three ashrams, Brahmacharya, Grihastha, I'm sorry, Brahmacharya, Vanaprastha, and Sanyas. But in household life, the association with the opposite sex is done for producing Krishna conscious children like that. That is the, uh, what is said, concessionary principle that allows for society to develop in a family type of atmosphere. So when that is done, according to the rules and regulations, then uh, that is beneficial for everyone. But generally we see people associate with the opposite sex to fulfill some need for sense gratification. And even in married life, the restrictions continue according to certain prescribed rules and regulations. Not that I have a wife, I have a husband, therefore I, because I married, I can have as much uh, enjoyment on, on the sensual level as I desire. And that is not grihasta, it is called griha medi, which means living in family life, but actually no better than animal life. Therefore, even in, in grihasta life, restrictions are given an association should be done in order to facilitate Krishna consciousness. So uh, in the uh, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that I am that sex life which is not contrary to religious principles. In other words, uh, to engage in sex life for the propagation of Krishna conscious children is one of the duties of the household and that is also done according to the rules and regulations of the, um, what is that called? I think it's the Manu Samhita, which is now known, and is known in terms of the different samskaras. So um, even in household life, we see that people don't follow rules and regulations. And therefore, the relationship between the, the husband and wife gravitates down to a physical relationship and therefore everything becomes more or less uh, based on fulfilling one's own lusty desires. And because of that, uh, household life becomes strained. In other words, one loses the, uh, one loses the understanding of what is the relationship in all of the four ashrams, because the word ashram actually means place of spiritual cultivation. So that, that includes the grahasta ashram too. So in that ashram, then there is a duty for each of the persons in the ashram to fulfill in order that religious principles remain foremost and devotional service is the goal. <coughs> Excuse me. So even in that ashram, there is not a license for sense gratification, although it's allowed under restricted, uh, uh, restricted principles. 
And that way, both can make progress on the path of devotional service. Um, outside of that, then if one associates with the opposite sex for sense gratification, or even in, in a, a whimsical way, because there's those who associate with the opposite sex just to satisfy their senses. Although they may not engage in uh, physical activities, still uh, that kind of association is not meant for spiritual development. It creates the mind in a different direction and one is simply in trying to find some satisfaction in, in that some material satisfaction in that association. So here, um, the illusion in bondage, as it says here in this purport, that accrue to a, to a man from attachment to any other object as complete as that resulting from association with men, men, women or with men to attach to women. And now the word woman, you have to understand, and we have explained this before, in the Shastras, the word woman means opposite sex. <laughs> for a man, woman is woman, and for a woman, man is woman. So that applies in both sides, times. So this uh, association has to be understood in regards to how to make progress in devotional service. Therefore, Prabhupada said in married life, there are ways that the husband and wife should associate, it's recommended, in order to facilitate Krishna consciousness. And that is that four things Srila Prabhupada mentions in the Bhagavad Gita, in one verse in the 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where he explains the, the um, items of knowledge. And in that, he talks about the association of husband and wife, and what is that uh, foundation for that association? And he mentions four things that the uh, husband and wife should associate with by one, taking prasadam together, two, reading Krishna book or Shastra together, three, chanting the holy names together, and worshiping their deity or the deity form of the Lord together. He makes these four principles the outstanding foundation for developing Krishna consciousness in the house of life and including the children. If the children are able to take part in these activities, they also can be included. So this is a great house to life. We find that even now today, one of the biggest problems in the world not, not only in the secular world, but even in the spiritual, uh, spiritual arena, uh, we find that there is so much difficulties in husband and wife relationships because people don't, are not trained in the principles of, of, uh, of uh, Dharma. They're not trained in the principles of samskaras. They're not trained in the principles of proper association. And therefore, people simply follow the ways of the world. And therefore, so many problems occur. Uh, and therefore, this verse, I mean, this verse, as is, re as is referenced here, 331, 33 to 35, is a series of verses that goes all the way up to verse 41, where the, uh, and I mean, Kapila Dave is speaking to his mother. He's not speaking to a group of sages and saints. He's speaking to his mother. <laughs> his mother is a woman, obviously. <laughs> and he's giving her the understanding of the importance and the value and the correctness of association. <laughs> She's a very, uh, what we say, respectable lady. And she comes from a very highly qualified family. She is the daughter of Swayam Bhuvamanu, who is the son of uh, 
of Lord Brahma. And uh, he's a very elevated person. He's not a small person. And she's his daughter. She gets married to a great sage who is a very powerful mystic named Kardama Muni. Kardama Muni doesn't want to, he's, he's detached, but he decides that he wants to have a wife. So he prays to the Lord for a wife, and then Krishna grants him this qualified lady. And if you read uh, the whole pastime, you'll see the relationship, how she serves him completely, and he uh, reciprocates her service by facilitating her desire for nice things in life. Because generally women like nice things in life. Um, women don't usually like, you know, strong forms of renunciation, like austerities. They are more attached to the niceties of life. And that's okay if it's in connection with Krishna consciousness. And so he knows that. And so he grants her a nice situation. And then he gives her nine daughters and one son. And after the son is born, he leaves. And now the son is taking care of the mother, as is explained in, in uh, Vedic culture, that when the mother no longer is protected by her husband, then the grown-up son has the responsibility to give protection to the mother. And therefore, she is now under his care. He just happens to be the supreme personality of God. As it's mentioned here, he's the incarnation of the Lord. And he's instructing her in the science of Krishna consciousness. Uh, this, ver this chapter 31 is practically the last chapter in the series of chapters where he gives instructions to his mother, very, very deep instructions. And she's asking questions and he's responding. So he's also explaining her here what, how to lose one's good qualities. And that is wrong association or unauthorized association. So uh, one should also understand that association is based on the principles of necessity. Uh, there is no necessity for sense gratification in, with the opposite sex. So there's no need for that association. Of course, in household life, there is a need. And that need is sanctioned and restricted according to rules and regulations. Why? For two things to happen. One, to allow for po both persons to make advancement in devotional service by keeping religious principles foremost. And the second is to develop a strong Krishna conscious relationship between each, each person based on values and respect for others. When sense gratification becomes the means for association, people who are, in, who are in that arena of activities generally lose respect for each other because the idea is the other person is there to fulfill my desires. And therefore there becomes a, a loss of respect for the other person and it becomes more like a fulfillment of one's own personal uh, material desires. And that gravitates to the relationship down to something very base and very ordinary. <laughs> So here we can learn a lot from this particular verse because it's, um, it shows what happens when one associates in the wrong way. All of these good qualities, shyness, austerity, fame, forgiveness, control of the mind and senses, good fortune, intelligence, mercy, cleanliness, all of these things are uh, destroyed by wrong association. Okay, so um, again, this verse is not a condemnation of any of the species, either man or woman, but it's a condemnation of the principles that lead one away from devotional life.
towards materialistic sense gratification. And this is the basis of the material world. Um, just like uh, Prabhupada was saying, when Prabhupada was there in the in early days in 26 Second Avenue, he was visited by various people. And one was a rock and roll group. They were kind of a very low class rock and roll group. So they asked Srila Prabhupada, is there sex after death? And what they, their understanding was different than Prabhupada's answer. And that is Prabhupada said, of course, you get another body after death. And then again, you're engaged in sex life. But they were thinking that, you know, if you die, that's the end of everything. But if there's still sex after death, then death is not so bad. <laughs> because you can still go on to enjoy. So Prabhupada was just kind of like overwhelmed to see how, how uh, determined people were to engage in sense gratification and not even fear death as long as they can have that enjoyment after death. So this is the material world, Mituni Baba. Uh, it's called uh, the shackles of sex life. Mm, shackles means chains, Mituni. Mituni means sex life. Baba means that kind of, that kind of gratification that comes in the, uh, what was it called? Uh, in the best possible way materially. Mm -hmm. Uh, just like uh, the whole material world works on this principle of uh, the attachment between man and woman and the desire to enjoy within that context. So if one can get attached to Krishna, then one can give up this attachment to uh, when we say these lower forms of enjoyment. And attachment to Krishna is the highest form of enjoyment, and attached to Krishna is actually natural for the soul. So, therefore, it, one should carefully, because rules and regulations are of two things to do and things to avoid. And if we follow both of these, then our, we can develop our attraction and attachment to Krishna. And getting attached to Krishna means losing attraction for the material, especially the desire to enjoy sex life. And one develops a higher taste. Um, when one develops a higher taste, then the lower taste is gone. So taste has to be there. There has to be some pleasure in life. So for the materialists, this is what they live for, this kind of pleasure. They work hard for that displeasure and they're willing to do anything to get it and sacrifice their own their whole life they just to get this little bit of so-called pleasure. But a devotee knows it's not pleasure, but it's just another form of diversion away from the real pleasure, and that real pleasure is devotional service. Devotional service is the highest form of transcendental pleasure, the highest form of pleasure in existence because it's the nature of the soul. And the soul's nature is to become attached to Krishna in devotion. And in that attachment, there is association. And in that association, there is pleasure. And as that association increases, then one has... Uh, Jamunacharya, he was a famous um, spiritualist. He was the, actually he became the uh, spiritual master of the great Ramanujacharya, Jamunacharya. His early life was, um, his, his very early life was pious and religious, but then something changed in his life and he uh, was given a kingdom, and he was ruling a kingdom. And when he had, when he took over the position of king, he forgot about his spiritual life and started to engage in sense gratification. 
in unlimited ways, kingly royal happiness, uh, the facility to, for sense gratification uh, in all different ways. And after some time, due to the mercy of his spiritual master, he brought him back to Krishna consciousness. And Junamunacharya writes one particular verse that Srila Prabhupada often quotes. Now he says, and when I think of my so-called enjoyment in my, when I used to engage in such things, I become disgusted and I want to, as Prabhupada used to use his, uh, his uh, uh, way of speaking English, he says, I want to spite on it. And spite means spit. In other words, I get disgusted when I think about material sense gratification because now I understand what is real happiness. And so when one, when just like a pig, he's wallowing in the mud and he's eating stool and he's thinking he's enjoying so nice. But someone says, oh my God, look at that pig. He's so dirty and he's just eating the most abominable food, abominable substance. Now, one gets disgusted just to think about it, what to see to speak about when they see it. And so, but the pig is thinking, hey, this is nice. And just like Prabhupada talks about the story of how Indra, Indra committed a great offense and he was forced to lose his position in the heavenly planets and take birth as a pig on earth. And so in his pig body, he, you know, he gradually had a, a family of piglets and he was there as a pig. But somehow because Indra was not in the heavenly planets, the, the heavenly planets were being mismanaged. And so they contacted Lord Brahma that we need Indra back because we need him to manage. So Brahma went to Indra who was in the pig body and wanted to bring Indra back to the heavenly planets. When he tried to bring Indra in the form of a pig back, uh, he resisted. <laughs> he resisted. He wanted to stay in his pig environment and have his family and have his mud and have his stool. And so uh, Brahma decided to do something drastic. He decided to kill all his family members, the other pigs. When Brahma, when, when uh, Indra saw that, then he gave up his desire to stay in the pig body and came back to the heavenly planets. So this is an example of how, you know, whatever particular body you have, you have a particular consciousness that is related somewhat to that body. And therefore you have a certain value. So for the human species of life, the real consciousness is Krishna consciousness. Jivair Sarupai Krishna and Nityadas, all living entities are part and parcel of Krishna and they have an eternal loving relationship with Krishna. And that, that is their success in life. But if they're in a different situation and they're enjoying in that other situation, they think, what is this Krishna consciousness? <laughs> you know, I got my, you know, I got my wife, I have my sex life, I have my money, I have my car, I got a job. Hey, I'm okay. This is this is life. Although they're suffering like crazy, because an intelligent man, when they see one in such a situation, they can understand the person's suffering. But he can't understand he's suffering, just like the pig cannot understand, just like Indra could not understand he was suffering in his pig existence. So this is a material life. And one, uh, by the arrangement of the material energy, one will accept whatever material situations they get to find themselves in as being the best or maybe something that is not so bad, but just needs a little bit of improvement here and there, and then soon I can enjoy like crazy. Uh, so this mentality leads one to hell, as it says here. Uh, uh, it leads one down to the lower forms of life. In other words, one takes birth in a lower species of life. 
And so one has to become uh, aware of the pitfalls that Maya presents in the form of happiness, especially the happiness that comes by way of sense gratification or sex life. Uh, sex life is meant for procreation. It's not meant for recreation, as we use that little cliche. It's given the facility. I can tell you a little interesting statement by Srila Prabhupada, and you might find this quite interesting. The pleasure that comes with sex life has been placed in that particular organ of the body because if that wasn't there, people would not engage in procreation and therefore they would not have children. So Prabhupada would make the point, why isn't that pleasure somewhere else in the body? Why in that particular organ? Well, to facilitate the desire to have children. Otherwise, people won't have children. Or if they do, they, you know, you can imagine that it's, uh, but this so-called little pleasure that comes with the um, contact in sex life is an impetus for family life, but it's not meant to be, be, be misused or, or wrongly used for sense gratification. So when we understand that, then we can understand how things are working. Why is that pleasure in that particular place simply to facilitate family life? but not beyond a certain point. So therefore there's rules and regulations and restrictions in that. So Prabhupada said the demigods under the guise of Krishna's instructions have arranged for that pleasure sensation to be there in order to facilitate the proliferation of children within the world. And that allows for that, that particular soul to take birth in a human form of life and get a chance to uh, become Krishna conscious. So everything is nicely arranged by the Lord. It's not an accident that that pleasure principle is in that particular place. It's simply to facilitate those living entities to come into the world and to have a chance to go back home, and back to Godhead. Okay. So we can speak a little bit more. And this is a very uh, broad subject. But we'll stop here. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Yeah, thank you, Guru Maharaj, uh, for the very nice class on this uh, topic, the ethics of association. Um, how it is important for us to associate in a, accordingly, which you mentioned. I really like that point like uh, which you can do things as condemn like opposite sex and uh, worldly people. So we should always be careful whom we are associating. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned about the Grihastha life. The goal of Grihastha life is to cultivate Krishna consciousness um, and propagate Krishna conscious uh, children and the real pleasure. Mm -hmm. And have, yeah, and have Krishna conscious children also. Children. Yes, Guru Maharaj. And the real pressure is to do devotional service and attachment to Krishna. Yeah, that's very mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. Guru Maharaj. Uh, oh. we, uh, we asked the devotees to please turn on your uh, cameras. <laughs> yeah, devotees, uh, please uh, turn on your cameras. Um, please, uh, if you have any questions or realizations, comments, uh, please unmute or you can type in the chat box or you can raise your hand. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare you. I'll just see Hare Krishna. Uh, Vrindavan Prabhuji, uh, please go ahead. Vrindavan Nath Prabhu. Uh, yes, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I thank you very much for this uh, topic. This was really, really 
it's a important topic and really uh, sometimes difficult to apply in life but i have one question guru maharaj just to understand um, in previous age while in general people were uh, very pious and they also had good knowledge of scriptures but still why few kings and sages had many wives well well there's there's generally two reasons for that one is that as palpa says the female population is always greater than the male population and it's a principle that all women should be married generally that's the principle so in order to facilitate that polygamy is allowed within the society of course western society doesn't allow that they don't allow that but people go around you know uh having relationships with other women at the same time although they have a wife <laughs> so uh and generally prabhupada also says the tendency for a man is to have more than one woman in life he said that's the, that's the male tendency so to fulfill that polygamy is also given but the main thing is to is to fulfill the needs of the the female population so every woman can become married but and nowadays people can't support more than one wife not even one wife but to speak of more than one but people years ago as you refer to kings and other great personalities they could facilitate that there is one probably that talks about this one mulak islamic he had 164 wives um where he lived in india is still the place is still there and there's a monument there with all of the different places that his 164 wives lived but you know modern society is uh, very much condemning of that idea and what happens uh you find that the women population is very loose and so they're on the prowl looking for relationships and therefore there is so much unwanted sex so much uh abortion so much unwanted children so much crime based on sexual activities yeah because you know they don't honor that principle and nowadays modern women don't like the idea well uh why should i have a co-wife you know <laughs> so they think well that's you know i want to be the only one so then the women population is is given is not understanding of that situation either so everything now is um, it's, it's the biggest problem in society is that uh the women are unprotected and uh, society and they even have these websites it's called uh what is it called extramaritalrelationships.com it's yeah in other words you can go on this website and you can have a relationship with another person who wants to have a relationship outside of their marriage and the marriageable partners allow for their partner to engage in such activities because they do it also which is all sinful it's very sinful because uh, these relationships outside of marriage are immediately in the modes of ignorance and relegate one to very heavy sinful reactions but in in married life it's done according to religious principles and so in order to facilitate and you'll see there's a, the woman population in every practically every country in the world is always greater than the male population so a lot of that's due to wars because most of the time men men are killed in wars and that's that increases the the disproportion between men and women 
But that's true in general. Mm -hmm. That's true in general. The chi China had a rule during communist China that uh, if a female baby was born, they would have to kill it. They can only have one female baby in the family. If they had more than one, the second one had to be killed. <laughs> that was a law in communist China. It may still be there now, I'm not sure uh, how they work. Because the, you know, the, male, the female populations is always greater. So there's a lot of social principles that are not being organized properly where people can live in a very natural environment, even within the material setting, what to speak of the spiritual principles. But as in relationship to your question, and that's the answer that the male, the female population is always greater than the male. And it's not a small proportion. The proportion is quite, quite, uh, there's quite a dichotomy in that. Sorry, Guru Maharaj, but I still have like related question in my mind, like some doubt because I understand the modern world that like, yes, this is not like it's completely degraded stage, but in the previous age, when everybody was fully aware of higher principles, higher spiritual uh, knowledge, and especially sages, uh, I can understand this thing from Chhatriya uh, because they were commanding the regions and they were having uh, different duties, but for sages who were the uh, kind of role model for many, uh, in terms of religious and spiritual principle, why they need to marry? They know that controlling sense as it's mentioned in uh, now Chaitanya Charitamitam and Bhagavatam also everywhere, it's most important principle. So they can ask somebody they like have, they, they can ask somebody in, sorry, Guru Maharaj. They followed religious principles though. Although they had more than one wife, they were following the religious principles. They weren't there, they were engaging in just, you know, sense gratification for the sake of sense gratification. I mean, many of the kings and also sages would say, what, what are some of the sages that had more than uh, one way? Can you think of some offhand? Hmm. Let me think, there are many. I mean, yeah, when we read, yeah, then many name comes. Um, there are many. I can't really, you know, my mind has gone blank now. I can't think of those sages that had more than one wife. Um, there was the, uh, what was his name? Mentioned in the ninth canto. But that was Vedic culture. Vedic culture allowed for that because again, the woman population was greater. And in order to have children, sometimes they have, we have the example of, uh, who was it? Well, we had King Yayati, he had, uh, he had two wives. And, who else? Uh, I'm trying to think of the sages that. Kashyapa Muni. Kashyapa Muni. Kashyapa Muni had uh, Aditi and Diti. But he was a progenitor. And just like also, uh, what's his name? That The main progenitor, what was his name? Daksha. Daksha had more than one wife. Um, but they were progenitors. They, their service was to, prop, was to propagate the world with the, the next version of the living entities. So they engaged in a lot of sex life in order to proliferate the, uh, the, the next creation. Kishap is also one of the progenitors also. Yeah. So it was a duty, it was a service. It was not done for sense gratification. 
We have to see that's the principle. Lord Nityananda, well, the Lord Nityananda, that is a little bit of a, why Lord Nityananda had two wives. He married Janava, but then when Vishuddha, her sister was serving, um, uh, then Lord Nityananda at a, at a banquet, there was a feast, uh, she manifested four arms in order to serve Lord Nityananda. When he saw that, he understood she was a divine person. And so he decided to marry her. But he never had any relationships with Janava. He had his relationships with Visuddha. And they had only two children, Birabhadra and Gangadevi. Birabhadra was an incarnation of Shiradaksha Vishnu and Gangadevi was an incarnation of the Ganges River. Yeah. But those in the kingly rule, they have a tendency to have many more wives. And that's because of their, as you said, the Kshatriya nature is like that. I even know some devotees who have more than one wife. But I won't mention any names. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Uh, stick with one wife, Vrindavan. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, no, Guru Maharaj. I was not thinking in that way. I was just thinking uh, this question was also raised because we do house, like, uh, do house programs every Friday here. So Many times these questions come from devotee and not even from non-devotee, not from devotee, but mostly people who are completely new. And it's, since it's a preaching movement, we should be fully equipped. So, and there is nobody better than <laughs> you know, answering these questions. So just trying to keep my knowledge base strong, Guru Maharaj. Okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. It's also, it's also economically safer to have only one wife. <laughs> you have to be you have to be on a kingly platform in order to maintain more than one. <laughs> Thank you, Prabhuji. Uh, you see what people you see what people do now in the material world rather than having more than one wife at the same time, they just keep switching wives. That's all they do. <laughs> so they go from one relationship to another. <laughs> and sometimes they're married two, three, four times. So it's another way of cheating, but it's in, that's not authorized. But the purpose of married life is for Krishna consciousness and to bring into the world Krishna conscious children. Vishabdev speaks about that in the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. One should not become mother, one should not become father, one should not become guru, one should not become teacher unless they can deliver their disciples, their children, their students from the cycle of birth and death. It's a great responsibility too. But many of these great sages who had more than one wife, their children were also great personalities too. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Okay. I thought you were condemning the idea. Were you condemning the idea? Or were you just trying to get some information to answer questions? <laughs> no, no, I was just... It's like trying to understand why uh, uh, these 
highly highly elevated sages and people were having this kind of so thank you i think i got the idea that it's primary to control but uh, okay okay thank you Raj Rajprabhu has a question. Rajprabhu, please go ahead. Raj. Raj, are you a Raj? My full name is uh, Raj. But Raj is a Raj? No, I'm not a Raj. Oh, okay. Raj means king. So I was wondering how many wives you had. Only one. That's enough for me. Only one, okay. <laughs> I please accept my humble basis with all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to yourself. Uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. To avoid all of such association completely in the current age seems incredibly challenging almost impossible. So what's the recommendation to protect ourselves so that even if we're amongst such Become people, Krishna consciousness. As much as possible. Become Krishna consciousness. Okay. Become Krishna consciousness and then you, you won't be affected so much. The stronger your Krishna consciousness, the less you're affected by the material arrangement. To strengthen your Krishna consciousness. Uh, but also follow the rules and regulations for proper association. And uh, keep chastity of speech. Chastity of speech is also a principle of chastity in relationship to the opposite sex. Okay, thank you, Akash. Thank you, Rabu. Um, devotees, any questions, any comments, realizations? Yeah, please uh, you can unmute and share. You can ask questions in a broader sense too, if you have any other topics you want to ask. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your lotus feet, Gurudev. So, um, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, my topic, uh, my question is not related to this topic, but a um, different one. Is that okay to ask Guru Maharaj? Yeah, uh, Sri Devi, is your question related to the topic? Let's take Sri Devi's question first and then we'll take yours. Of course, mm -hmm. no problem. Okay. My humble obeisance is Guru Maharaj, all glories to Srila Maharaj, all glories to your divine lotus feet. As you were relating this pastime of how we can in whatever situation we are materially think, oh, this is very nice, this is very nice and wonderful like Indra you know became a pig and I was I was writing down all those things I was thinking back to the pastime of uh, Manigriva and Nalukavara and how they were so intoxicated they were so shameless that even when Narad Muni came uh, they, they did not maintain a ticket and then Narad Muni taking pity on them feeling compassion cursed them in order to prevent them from gliding down into the lower species of life by saying come back as trees and you will get delivered when uh, Krishna comes and releases you from that tree body. So in that uh, beautiful pastime, it is so clearly explained how one can just get carried away by whatever material situation one is in and think that sense gratification is all in all. And then the next birth is just lower species of life. And uh, to me, that was a very, very big eye opener about how much Prabhupada has saved us from gliding down into the lower species of life. So I just, I'm deeply grateful for that. Thank you. Yeah. And he also said something very 
poignant. He said, this topic that we're discussing today should be discussed regularly. He says, if we do, if it, if we do not, then our movement will grow weak. People will internalize the wrong ideas and not broach the subject in an intelligent way and therefore will develop wrong understandings and wrong ideas and ultimately wrong activities. So he, he said this, 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 that's why it's discussed in the Bhagavatam quite clearly. So everything is clear and based on proper understanding of philosophy and principles and how it relates to our Krishna consciousness. So uh, this is not a, a taboo subject. It's a subject that needs to be uh, approached in the proper way. And we tried our best using references on the Shastras as the foundations for the discussions. Uh, Guru Maharaj, may I just continue on this uh, topic just a little bit, some observations, or I can wait if you like. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was thinking about my, you know, experiences about, you know, the looseness that exists in present society, the too much association, you know, even casual association between men and women, this is all unheard of, you know, when I was growing up, uh, my grandmother, I mean, she was a really old lady, but the moment my dad was coming back from office finished, she would scuttle off into the inside portions of the house and she wouldn't be seen because there was a shyness, there was a certain mood that, you know, the man of the house has come and I don't want to be around like that. And even too much talking between males and females, even of the same family, was just not, not considered appropriate, you know? And here, I mean, in the Western world, you know, hi, how are you? How's this? How's that? I mean, there's so much looseness. And then if we say anything, we're considered fanatical or we're considered old fashioned or too much or this or that. We're supposed to be liberal and with it and, you know, be broad minded, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that maintaining that distance and maintaining that uh, sort of dignity and that, and that uh, shyness and that etiquette is so important for chastity to be maintained in all relationships. That's just my, my take on it. No, that was, an, that was a perfect uh, understanding of how the Vedic culture has aligned itself with the principles of devotion in all aspects of life. Yeah, so that's there. You obviously you grew up in a in a very pious family that understood growing up in Vedic culture, but now all of that is being lost by television. Television has destroyed it all. And television is one of the biggest things in India right now. Everybody has television. Everybody has so many channels that are available. They got these big, uh, big, uh, I don't know what they call them, uh, monitors on their house where they can access 150 channels now. Uh, be, television has ruined everything in, in, in India. The I'm Vedic culture was, was, is still a little bit strong in certain areas, but it's being destroyed by television. And television has introduced a whole lifestyle based on sense gratification. I would say the so Hindi film industry, Guru Mara, the Hindi film industry is really destroyed. You know, any decency, any sense of shame, the way the girls are made to dress up and dance around and expose their self. I mean, it's like a travesty, you know, of decency to see all that stuff is like, you know, sin for the... My, my, god, sister, my god sister, she did a presentation to just ladies, 300 different ways to wear a sari. Yeah, and she made that a presentation in Mayapur to the young girls in Mayapur. 300 different ways to wear a sari. 
And there's a proper way to wear a sari. <laughs> but now ladies are wearing them like bathing suits, you know? So it's, it's become something different now. So yeah, everything is getting loose. This is Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga means uh, do whatever you want, whenever you want, and call it modern, call it new, call it uh, a way to uh, expand the proclivities of my choices in life. <laughs> it's, uh, it's all crazy. One follows the Vedic culture. Vedic culture is human culture. It's geared towards sense, it is geared towards Krishna consciousness. At least it's geared towards piety, but ultimately it's geared towards Krishna consciousness. But all that's lost. And so therefore one has to somehow or other uh, be very strict in the execution of their devotional service. And that way they'll stay unaffected in devotional, uh, in, with all these material uh, deviations that are going on everywhere. So the strength, the, the, the principle here is become more and more Krishna conscious. That's the main principle. Shamarani, would you like to present your question? Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, thank you. Um, so uh, basically my question is um, um, about like, you know, lots of great devotees like um, um, Pandavas or that's just an example or Devki Mata or, and there's so many, I'm sure there's so many other devotees. Um, and in, in their life, they ha like have lots and lots of problems, um, you know, in, in spite of they being like see, such a sincere souls. So, um, and these problems are definitely not Krishna conscious um, uh, problems. So how do I understand this, Guru Maharaj? How do you understand that the problems that devotees have in family life are not- I'm talking about like a great world. Sorry, Kumara, I'll repeat again. So I'm just talking about uh, like a really great souls, like, you know, we're talking about like Pandavas or um, Devki and, and so many other, um, Kunti Mata and so many other um, great souls had um, lots of difficulties, so many problems in their life, um, in spite of they being, so they are such a sincere devotees of Krishna. And, um, and so definitely these problems are not um, Krishna consciousness, um, lo not lack of Krishna consciousness. So how do I, um, how do I understand this? Well, it's, I mean, there's different reasons for that. Otherwise, everyone has to go to a, to a stage of purification. So, in, but there's two things. One, for great souls, many of the problems that you apparently see in their life are actually, um, situations arranged by the Lord to glorify the person. For instance, Srila Prabhupada, he had to undergo two heart attacks. He actually had a, a third one also. Uh, he came up, he didn't have any money, he didn't get any support. His, his tape recorder and his, uh, his um, other item was stolen when he got here. Prabhupada had so many difficulties but that was just to glorify him, to show that this person will go through anything and experience anything to push on Krishna consciousness. So for many great souls, there are uh, arrangements by the Lord for them to be glorified because of that. But it's hard to see from, the, from our perspective and practically impossible to see. Others may also have, they might be great souls, but they still might have some little material attachment. So that little material attachments may also cause them some difficulty, although they are very elevated in their spiritual practice. Okay. 
Yeah. But it's not like the conditioned souls. The conditioned souls have accepted difficulties as a way of life. Yeah, thank you, Mataji. Uh, Gurvaj, we have a question on the chat box by uh, the singer Leela Mataji. Um, dear Maharaj, mm -hmm. can you please explain a little the term uh, chastity of the speech? Thank you. Um, I'll repeat Chast the question. Chastity. Oh, chastity. Yeah, can we of the expect speech? you? One should speak truthfully and beneficially. One should avoid speech that offends, and one should regularly quote the scriptures. That is chastity of speech. One should speak truthfully, beneficially, avoid speech that offends, and regularly quote Shastra to back up statements that they make. That's chastity of speech. And within different uh, associations, one should understand the purpose of that association and use speech to facilitate that purpose and not something outside of that. People speak for the sake of speaking because the tongue cannot be controlled. It's considered, it says, this tongue is the most difficult and most voracious to control. Therefore, people will speak just to speak and say anything off the top of their head. <laughs> Therefore, in order to curb that and to curtail that and to streamline it, therefore, one should speak beneficially and truthfully and avoid speech that offends others. That's from Shastra. That's from the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna gives the austerities of speech. Yeah, Speaking much. frivolously or whimsically simply agitates the mind and doesn't benefit anybody. Sometimes we tell some jokes, but that is a side thing that devotees do in certain association. And that's normal in life also to joke, but that also has to be done in a, in a proper way and not in a whimsical way. <laughs> so, yeah. Is that okay, Mataji? Um... Okay, Mataji said yes, Guru Maharaj. Um, okay. I um, but we should also mention in this particular uh, discussion, which is very important to hear, we are not these bodies. We may have a male body, we may have a woman, a female body, but this is not our, this is not who we are. In a previous life, we could have had a, uh, we could have had the opposite body, and we did. We may have a, a woman now could have been a man in their last life, and vice versa. So to get hung up on this bodily conception of life is also one of the defects that causes one to think and act wrongly. But still, one should follow proper etiquette accordingly. And therefore, there is certain behavior according to gender and according to association. <laughs> Just like it says, you have to park your car here. If you park your car here, it's an authorized parking space. If you park your car in the no parking zone, you'll get a ticket. So our, our body is a car. <laughs> So we have to learn where to park it also, how to, how, to, how to use it in the proper way. So the body also has to be used in the proper way. But we have to understand we are different in the body. 
That's the first principle of spiritual life. They were not these bodies. Therefore, sense gratification based on, uh, on material principles simply exasperates our attachment to the material body. That's all it does. And reinforces the wrong consciousness. <laughs> It reinforces material consciousness. Mm -hmm. hmm. Thank you, Kuzmaraj. Um, okay, I think it looks like we've reached the end. Uh, I have a question, Gurmash, if it's okay, can I ask, or can I can ask tomorrow? Sure, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. um, my question is like uh, regarding family attachment, Gurmash, like, uh, so, like, um, uh, today you mentioned about the Grihastha life, right? So, anything like, uh, if we perform, if in the Grihastha life, if we cultivate the Krishna consciousness, and if we engage in the service of Krishna, then it's like a grihastha life. Uh, so we have to engage, like as a family, mention like two things, like taking prasadam, reading Prabhupada books and deity worship. So we are engaging in that service, but still in that process, uh, we still have that attachment towards um, kids that, you know, we have that, okay, they are my kids. Um, so is that still material, Guru Maharaj? It uh, depends how you see it. It's material if you see it in the wrong way. These are my, these are children that were sent to me by Krishna in order for me to guide them and give them a life in, in Krishna consciousness. They're spirit souls. Every spirit soul belongs to Krishna. So whether it's your husband or your children, they don't belong to you, but they've been given to you in that association for a particular uh, goal in life, a particular di direction in life. Therefore, as a mother, you have to take care of your children as a mother would take care of her children. You can develop affection for your children and for the husband also. That affection is also a way to nurture care and service. If you don't have any affection develops for these, then, then the inspiration for care and service is also minimized or even lost. But you have to understand that ultimately these children have been sent to you by God for you to take care of them. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's mostly like service. Uh, you should have they belong to Krishna, not to you. But you are in the role of a mother, so you develop that relationship based on that. So we don't negate affection on the material level as long as the principle of Krishna consciousness remains foremost. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think I have two things. Uh, I still have, like, they are my kids. I still have them. Yeah. Yeah, but definitely I'm trying to, we are trying to engage in a devotional service and, you know, drop out books. They're, they're been given to you. Mm -hmm. To say they're yours is one thing, but to say that they've been given to me by Krishna is actually the correct understanding. Mm -hmm. I mean, Krishna is the source. Even if man and woman come together, it's up to Krishna whether a child is born or not. And what, what child is actually born into that particular womb is also under the control of higher powers, not under your control. So everything is orchestrated on a higher level and you, have, you play a role, but you're not the main person. There are people who can't have children for whatever reason, or I've seen I've seen this in devotee life many times. Devotee, husband and wife, they can't have a child. They try and try and try. And then after some time, the child is born. 
Why? Because it wasn't the right time. While Krishna was waiting to choose a particular soul to enter into that womb to be born to that particular person. Everything is orchestrated perfectly on the higher level. We can't see that. It's controlled by material nature, and material nature is under the full control of the Supreme Personality of God. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Why you have a particular child who is your child is because this is God's arrangement. It's a fact. But you but you're the mother. And mother means love for the children. If, mom, women don't, if mother doesn't have love for their children, what's the, there's no value in that relationship. It's natural. There are things on the material world and the material level that are natural. The love for a mother for her children is natural. But you have to understand these children ultimately belong to Krishna. <laughs> So without that understanding, it's like mostly attachment, Guru Maharaj. It's material. Well, attachment is good if it brings about Krishna consciousness, if it brings about care, if it brings about education. Yeah, that kind of attachment is good. Okay. But if it brings about sense gratification, then that attachment uh, will simply overshadow the purpose of the relationship and create another purpose which is contrary to the real real relationship the meaning of the relationship how long will those those living entities be your children for so many years they'll grow up they'll have their own children they'll get married and then you'll leave the world and then it's all over. But you did your service, and then you move on to a higher platform for position. So for 50, 60, 70 years, we stay in a certain family life, or maybe even less, and then we move on to another situation. But life's eternal. And if you come back again, your mother or father again, you'll have another set of children. And they'll be different. <laughs> or you could also, you know, you could also come back as the grandchild of your of your uh, grandchildren. <laughs> you can become the child, and then they can become the mother, and then they're taking care of you. It happens too. There's even evidences of that. That's karma. Mm -hmm. Well, don't get stuck on your role, but play your role perfectly. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I like that example which you gave, Guru Maharaj, like big example. <laughs> I feel like that, you know, after hearing so many things still, like, you know, we have that attachments, uh, especially to family. Uh, as you... Uh, I'm sorry, Guru Maharaj. Uh, my voice audible? It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a little low. It's audible, but it's low. Yeah. So I like that example, Guru Maharaj, which you mentioned today. Lord, a big example. So even after hearing so many things, uh, we still have that attachment. Uh, definitely not sense gratification, but, you know, attachment to family is there. But as you said, we have to think that they are children of Krishna. And we have to do our service, have to do our role to make That's them. who we really are. Yeah. yeah. This is our real identity. We have, in this world, we, we have to act out the roles that we are set in. That's all. 
But ultimately, we have to develop our love for Krishna and those that are under our care, we also have to direct them. It's our duty to direct them towards loving Krishna also. If you give them Krishna, that is real love. You can give them some food, you can give them some place to stay, and you can give them so many other things. And that's important and it's necessary. But ultimately, if you give them Krishna, you're giving them the highest. <laughs> Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. Thank you. I like that point which you mentioned, one who develops higher taste, we lose the lower taste automatically. So we need to develop that higher taste more and more. Yeah, by association. Yeah, so. the, the higher taste comes by chanting the holy names of the Lord, mm -hmm. hearing the pastimes of the Lord, and associating with devotees of the Lord. There's where you get the higher taste. Sadhu Sangha. Yeah. Chant Hare Krishna. Yes, Guru. We say chant and be happy. And that's, that's not a cliche, that's an, an absolute principle. Chant and be happy. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you. Shamarani, I wanted to ask you a question in relationship to some service. Yes, um, Guru uh, Can I talk to you on the phone? Yes, of course. I, I'll call you, Guru Maharaj. Okay, good. That's... Okay, thank you. My doorbell is ringing, and so I have to disappear. <laughs> so thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. And we'll see you on Tuesday for the next session hosted by Vrindavan Nath Prabhu. He will be our glorious host for tomorrow's program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you so All much, Guru Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.